Welcome, everyone. So good to see uh, folks here. Um, uh, I would uh, be understating things if I didn't say I was thrilled and honored uh, to welcome Dr. Natasha A. Kelly here today. I'm super excited, as I know you all are, for this conversation on the past future of Black German feminism. So I'm going to start by introducing Dr. Kelly um, and welcome Dr. Kelly. I'm trying to contain myself and not be a, a big geek about this, but I'm really uh, excited about, um, about your talk. I've been following your work, of course, as everyone else has, and um, just ex amazing and powerful and very necessary work. So I'm really thrilled um, and honored to welcome you. Um, Dr. Natasha Kelly, A. Kelly, is an independent scholar, author, and curator. She has a PhD in communication studies and sociology with a research focus on German colonialism and black feminism. Born in the UK and raised in Germany, Dr. Kelly has taught at numerous universities in Germany and Austria. As a research assistant at the Center for Transdisciplinary Gender Studies at Humboldt University, Berlin, she dealt with the decoloniality of knowledge, power, and beings. Dr. Kelly's work as an author, curator, and visual artist has been celebrated and exhibited across Germany and the world. And in her publications, Afroism, Sisters in Soul, Afroculture, and in her creative work, Edewa, the Postcolonial Supermarket, The Poison Cabinet, and African Diaspora Palace, World Exhibition Reformation in Wittenberg in 2017, she combines theory and praxis to cr create transfer lines between academia, society, and politics. In addition to her consulting work for various art institutions, she was the artistic director of the sequential theater series, My Sister which was based on her book, Sisters and Souls, and performed at the HAU Hebel am Ufer Theater in Berlin from 2015 to 2018. Her award-winning debut film, Millie's Awakening, was commissioned by the 10th Berlin Biennale and screened at the Museum for Modern Art, MMK Frankfurt am Main, at the Kirchner Museum, Davos, Austria at the Art Association Australia and New Zealand, and at the Bundeskunsthalle Bonn. The eponymous bilingual book to her film was published in 2018 and is available at Orlando Frauenverlag in Berlin. Natasha has been active in the Black German community for years and describes herself as an academic activist. And uh, Please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Natasha A. Kelly here today. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. There you go. I think you can hear me now. Thank you, um, Sonia. Um, yeah, I'm I'm a bit flattered, <laughs> but I will I will try and keep keep my contenance. I would like to add something that I'm presently. Um, talking to you from the foot of the Sun Mountain today, known as Pikes Peak in Colorado, where I have a visiting professorship, uh, the Max Carter visiting professorship at Colorado College. I just finished my visiting professorship in um, at the University of Rhode Island and come land inward, so to say, in West. Um, which is the home of the Ute, the Arapaho, the Comanche, the Cheyenne, the Kiowa, the Apache, and many more. As rightly reminded in the chat uh, one or two days ago, I also want to recognize the loss of million nameless African people on this land. And furthermore, um, I would like to ask for a moment of silence to bring the commemoration of the victims of Hanau to this space. Two years ago to this day, um, they were murdered by a white supremacist terrorist, terrorist in Hanau. Say their names. Ferat Unvar, 
Hamza Kurtovic, Said Nessa Hashemi, Willi Vorel Paun, Mercedes Kirpatsch, Kaloyan Velkov, Bati Zaragoglu, Sedat Gürbitz, Gökhan Göltekin. May they forever rest in peace. I am going to share my screen with you before I dive into my topic. Um, let me see if I get this right. Okay. Um, sound on. There you go. Yeah. Let me push this up. Okay. The past future of Black feminism in Germany. I'm not gonna say a lot about the title until the end. And I hope that it becomes clear why I actually chose this title. Um, what I can say is that um, what you're gonna hear today are excerpts um, from a book that I'm presently writing. I was um, for the first time after 2020, um, invited by one of the major publishers, Pipa Falak, to write a book um, about white feminism. And I must say I declined because I told them if you were following my work and if you really know what I do, I don't write about white feminism, but if you're interested, in um, a book on black feminism, which has a long, a long history in the German context, I'll be happy to write that book. And um, after debating in their structures, they said, oh, yes, okay, um, we're, we're, we're interested. And so I've been working on a publication I should be writing now and not, not, not holding lectures, but I, could, I, I couldn't miss this for anything. So I want to share with you an excerpt from this book um, where I literally go into, um, I dive into the, the history of Black feminism in Germany and starting point for me, oops, wait a minute, how do I move forward here? There you go, is um, of course, Faber Bekennen. Um, it is starting point for many scholars, especially scholars from abroad here from the USA. Um, but I have to also say that it's not the beginning of black feminism in a German context. And I, I really would like to um, emphasize this. I think it's um, important to say that the women around Faber Beken no doubt did a fantastic job and I'm very grateful throughout my life to have found this book, different episodes of my life. But I think that it gained a, um, a huge visibility through Audre Lorde as a public figure and through Audre Lorde also the international recognition um, of, this, um, of this publication translated to Showing Our Colors. I can't remember who, who actually um, mentioned that Showing Our Colors doesn't emphasize, the, the English title doesn't emphasize actually the search, the historical search, the historical work being done in the community for several decades. I think that was a really, really good point that was made. I can't remember who, who, who said it, but you know who you are. That was a, um, and that was a good, that was a good point. I would also like to include the fact that um, back then in the 80s, Audrey Lord was actually asked by the Orlando Frauenverlag at the time 
to publish a book about her experiences in Germany and she declined. She said, no, it's not me who is supposed to be writing about, um, about the experiences of black German women, um, but these black German women have to write for themselves. And this is how um, Faber Buchanan Faber uh, came into existence. Being a publisher at the Orlando Falak myself for several years now, over a decade now as well, I think that it's also important to mention that the interest for Faber Buchanan was um, went down. It declined for um, for a, for a long time from the let's say from the twenty from the thousand two thousands to around two thousand and ten when the, um, my, the Gröben Ufer was renamed to Maya Yim Ufer, um, also through the, um, the work, the activism of, of a lot of different individuals and organizations um, in cooperation then later on with, with the politics um, who um, yeah, made it actually happen because it was political action that had, had to take place at that point. But from 2000 to 2010, the interest in Faber Buchanan was not um, was not that high, was not that great, um, and it was through the the renaming of the street that my Ayim Faber Buchanan was then um, brought back into into the center, into the center of our community. This is where I'm speaking from a community perspective as an academic activist, as I was just now introduced. But the, um, through the, the renaming of the Mayahim Ufa, the interest rose. And this was also the time where I was at the Humboldt University and at the gender department, um, where I was from 2010 to 2013. And I took this, uh, the renaming of the street to actually um, inter introduce my Ayim to my students at the time. Um, I think I can actually say that I'm one of um, few black scholars in the German context who actually worked with Maya Yim during this time, brought them into um, practically um, combining black feminist theory with post-colonial theory and um, using the renaming of the street as, as, as the reason practically to also look into um, Black German history on an on an academic um, on an academic level, or let me say, from an actual academic position, um, without denying all the work that is being done outside of academia. This led um, not only to Edeva, the postcolonial supermarket that Sonia. Um, mentioned earlier on that I don't want to talk about today, but I do want to, to um, bring into focus the two volumes of Sisters and Souls, um, which led to the theatre series My Sisters is um, a, 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 um, uh, commemorated to my Ayim. And in these two volumes, the there are cohorts of young Black um, German poets, academics, writers, who I think need more visibility. This is why I'm mentioning it at this point, not because I published it, because I actually think that these, um, these young, um, young, young, young girls magic, black girls magic, young girls with brilliance, there's the really amazing um, contributors in both editions. Um, first edition came out in 2015 and the second last year. And I think that especially with the work that's being done from abroad, you need to take a peek into these two volumes and have a look at some of these really, really amazing young Afro-Germans, Black Germans who um, stand in the tradition of my Ayim. Yeah. As I mentioned, Faber Buchanan was not the first, um, or the women around Faber Buchanan were not the first women to actually organize in the German context. Um, this became or was brought to my knowledge by um, Nadu Hormann, who was one of the protagonists in my film, Millie's Awakening. Um, it was actually really nice how we met. She came after um, one of our theater performances. On that day, there had been um, a huge full spread in the tats 
um, Berlin newspaper or local um, national newspaper. And um, I was interviewed by a black journalist about Maya Heem and why we did this performance. And she came to us after the show and she said, yeah, um, she was just so amazed that this was the first time in her life that she had opened um, a German newspaper to actually um, see three black women um, taking center stage on this, on, this, um, in this, on this page, on this full page. But then she said, yeah, but you forgot something. And I remember that moment because we were all standing on stage, the show was just finished. We were like full of adrenaline. And then all of a sudden, everybody stopped, everybody was quiet, no? And then she's like, oh, I didn't want to disturb her. She's a very quiet, quiet personality, quiet character anyway. And, she, and we were like, no, we were like, we were all interested. She's like, okay, what did we forget? And then she said, yeah, you forgot about us. You forgot about us. We were already active in the seventies. And she started telling me her story about how um, they, she belonged to a black woman group in the, um, in the 1970s who were already active in Berlin, who um, were um, doing different political activities. They also, um, at that time, the medium was radio. So they were in, um, on radio, um, um, broadcasting um, um, topics related to, to their oppression, but also um, looking for other black women to join these, um, to join their group. And um, she mentions Guy St. Louis in this context as one of the founders of this group, of the movement of the 70s. And um, if, you want to, if you want to find more out about this, then I, I really recommend reading the book to the film at this point because um, I couldn't include everything in the film. Um, it would have been too long and you know, there are thousands of technical reasons and so on and so on. But the unshortened versions of all of the interviews of all of the women are in the book. And in this context, I really would like to highlight Nadu's um, interview where she really talks about the seventies and the women's movement in the 70s. So even before Father Buchanan was even a thing, let's, let's, let me put it that way. They had also, um, they also wanted to, um, wanted to publish a book about their lives, their biographies and their experiences. And I think that these parallels are really, really, um, really important. But she also criticizes that the movement of the 1970s didn't get any public um, public attention, yeah, you know? and that um, they were missing like the, the public fi figure as the women in the eighties had through Audrey Lord, yeah, and then that 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 has um, a continuity of not being there but not being noticed. So it was a total constructive critique that she made to us, all of us black women of the younger generation standing there on stage. And that was the, for me the moment, okay, we got to do something. Now I was all, you know, into it. And actually my film was supposed to be about the 60s and the 70s. Millie's Awakening was supposed to be about the 60s and the 70s. And so I started looking for, for, for women of, this gen, of these generations who um, wanted, you know, to tell their stories, to, to fill this gap, no? Because we, we're... We, we stand in this tradition of tracing our history, of filling gaps, of rewriting history. And um, I think that um, I, I've managed to find um, a lot of them. Um, Guy St. Louis, unfortunately I didn't found, but I found a many more, but they all didn't want to, um, to, to talk in front of the camera. They were all of this older generation, um, and I must say Nadu is 60 plus, although she doesn't look like it, but she, um, of this older generation, they were like, yeah, okay, if you wanna write a book, that's fine, but camera, no, no. To, to also emphasize the difference of today when you know we're doing our selfies for Instagram and Facebook and you know what, that um, these women, they, they had this, they were, they, were, they were really shy, they shied away from the camera why I then ended up doing an intergenerational or multi-generational film, starting with the youngest, Masiri, who you can see on the cover of the book, leading to Nadu, and then all the, um, there are 40 years difference between these two, and then actually showing the, um, the, the continuity 
of, um, of, of black feminist thought and how that also relates or is reflected in the arts, you know? But I can then only go on and say also the Nadu's generation, the women around Guy St. Louis were not the first. <laughs> I, ke I, keep, I kept on going back and back and back and back, but um, to try and, um, try and, try and not um, make too many leaps, uh, let's put it that way, although I cannot mention everyone I've found, I'm just trying to show the continuity um, back in, in history. But for the 1960s, I think it's really important that we, um, that we, we highlight a little bit more the work that Fazia Janssen did. And she was born in, the 90, in 1929 in Hamburg and she survived national socialism, although she was sent to the concentration camp Neuen Gamma. And um, Fazia Janssen is one of few black women who we know survived um, survived national socialism and survived the con concentration camps and not only national socialism but actually su su survived being in um, in a concentration camp her um, father um, she was born outside of wedlock to um, to a maid and to the Liberian consul um, who was in Hamburg um, this family story is also really amazing. I'm going to say a bit more about that when we get back in time, but just keep this in, in mind for now. Um, what I, I think is that really important that um, Vazi Yang Anderson wasn't only just a Black woman, she was also a Black woman doing Black feminist politics. Maybe she would not have called it that herself, but I think that it definitely stands in, in the tradition of Black feminist theory. And she was a Liedermacher, so, so I don't even know if that really translates to singer-songwriter. I think Liedermacher is something very, very specifically um, German. But I, I have brought a music example for you to actually show that she was dealing with topics of racism in her songs and deconstructing racism in her songs. It's German, but I do have a translation afterwards. I hope you can hear it. Let me know if it's loud enough.
Okay, I want you also to take notice of the photo, yeah, that is the one black woman standing in front of these white men, no? not to use the metaphor, the old white man, but I guess they are that today. But let me translate this for you, what she's talking about. Um, quote, before we demonstrate, I want to sing to you of coming times, which we are preparing for our kids. Sing about what is to come. Peace, freedom, liberty rise up to fight and march. Who has a different skin needs not to fear, fear the questions and looks that suppress us. Nobody is caught in the ghetto. Peace, freedom, liberty, rise up and fight and march. This is just the beginning of the song. So the message is that uh, we know from Faber Buchanan that we um, that were that were propagated in the 70s. These same messages actually were propagated in the 60s through Fazia Janssen, for example. I would like to also mention at this point that there is a school in Overhausen that is named after Fazia Janssen, and that there is a, a library um, presently being opened in um, in Hamburg by a, a sister in Hamburg, um, also named after Fazia Janssen, now called the Fazia Teek. And in this um, sense, I also would like to acknowledge the library that just opened in Cologne, in Cologne named after Theodore Michael, who also was a survivor of national socialism. So meanwhile, in the, while, Fazia Janssen is leading the peace movement of the late 60s in the West. We have Angela Davis in the East. And um, I'm not gonna say too much about this because I think that this story is very familiar to a lot of people um, who are here, who are listening right now. The fact that um, Angela Davis was celebrated, not to say appropriated by the East German government there was a national campaign, One Million Roses for Angela Davis. The idea of this was that um, the, the civil society individuals write postcards and letters to Angela Davis who, who had been acquitted and was in jail um, during that time. These letters and postcards got sent to jail and um, as, as, a, as, as a protest, uh, um, a, a peaceful protest action as, we, as they have continuity in the East, yeah? But I found it really more interesting that um, Angela Davis and Fazia Janssen actually knew each other and that they, um, that they also yeah, fought side, and side, side, side by side, so to say, as um, black feminists on the, on the front lines. Here's a picture that I found um, of them in the Women's Peace Bus in 1987. So a bit later, I'm circling around, as you can see, um, in, on their way to the, um, to the Kreml and a women's, um, women's gathering that was taking place, an international women's gathering that was taking place in the Kem Kreml at the time. What these two also have in common though, um, which I would like to mention is their love to the blues. That's what a lot of people don't associate um, Angela Davis with being an, a blues expert. Um, she wrote this amazing book, um, Black Feminism and the Blues and Blues Women. I'm, I'm, I don't know the title, sorry. Um, but it's, it, it, it deals with black feminism in connection with um with with blues women right back to to the early um early 20th century and Fazia Janssen also uses the blues in her um she did a lot of um covers from blues musicians she even covered Elvis Presley we know Elvis Presley is not the originator of his music so these two are even connected through the continuity of the form of communication that that they used both in their context and that we also see reflected in Maya Yim's Blues in Black and White which is a prominent example of the work that Maya Yim does no I am gonna leap back around into the DDR, into the, um, what's it called, the GDR? So into East Germany. Um, 
to also introduce a few important incidents where black women actually took leading roles or where black women ex in, in, in the, or, and, and, and black feminism as a theory. And I'm not saying that all these women would definitely um, um, self-describe themselves as feminists. That's not what it's about, but they do stand in black feminist theory. And this is what I'm trying to show, the continuity of, 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 of an ideology, of a thought pattern that, that reaches way back, as you will see. But in, in East Germany, there were also um, really important moments where this is reflected. Yeah? Um, first of all, I found this image, the top left that you can see of Veronika Prempe or Veronika, Veronika, I don't know how that would be pronounced. She's from Ghana. And um, I am still searching for her. So this is as also work in progress, I would like to add. So I, I haven't found too much information about her and about the speech that she held in 1960 at the Federal Congress of the Democratic Women's Association of Germany, as they were called, in East Germany. But what we do know is that um, 1960, so um, Ghana had just gained independence three years earlier in 1957. And there is a long history and a long connection of East German, if you look at Brandenburg and Ghana. Brandenburg, where the um, so-called Afrikanische Compagnie set sail to um, the Gold Coast, today's Ghana, and built the Groß Friedrichsburg in, um, in the in the 17th century, early 18th century. And along the way, Otto von Gröben, he committed many crimes against humanity, not only enslavement, but also he got um, um he raped one of his um uh, one of his maids, I've forgotten the name, I'm sorry. Um and also the, the, the Ghana, the Volta region of Ghana was part of the German colony Togo. No? So we, we see here also that there is, there is a continuity of connection right up leading back to Maya Yim again, who was of um, Ghanaian descent, you know, and also with the Gruben Ufa being, being renamed to Maya Yim Ufa. So here again, the, the, this whole connectivity um, uh, um, becomes visible if you just by looking at even East German's role as well, AKA Brandenburg in this case, which is in East Germany role on, um, in all of this. Um, Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana said, um, and I quote him, um, Ghana will neither join any power bloc nor maintain a blind policy of neutrality and non-alignment, end of quote. So I can't read my own writing, but um, so, here, um, what I read in between the lines is that um, in a similar way that, that Angela Davis was also um, appropriated by the East German government, that these international women's congresses that took place, where um, you see really Veronica Prempel being at the center, yeah? Ghana at that time just being, you know, becoming the first African state to be independent. She also seems to have gone through some kind of um, appropriation here which I still have to still have to find and still have to still have to still have to prove you yeah? know but um it is known that 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 East Germany um made several attempts to to politically dominate Ghana and influence the ideological development of this new state and I, I believe that in this context this image of Veronica Prempel can actually also be read but there were also um in the 1970s, um, the Mad Germanis, we've heard a lot about them um, at this conference as well, just to mention them as, as well. The, the, the contract workers in East Germany, what um, um, I would like to highlight alongside Veronika Prempel is are the, the children, refugee children that, that were saved from Namibia and brought to, um, to this, the Be Berlin Castle in East Germany, where they actually grew up. So the situation as follows, um, Germany had um, the colony Southwest Africa, today's Namibia, 
And after the First World War, Namibia as the only, um, only country, well, all the countries got given to, to, to the allies. Cameroon went to France and Togo went to England and so forth. But, um, but Namibia as the only country went to South Africa. So it was the only African country under apartheid that got, so to say, or gained um, a German colony after the First World War. And the apartheid system was implemented in Namibia. So um, in, the, in the early 80s, when the, when the, when the independence war from between, um, between Namibia and South Africa took place, a lot of um, uh, refuge, refugees or Na Namibian civilians at the time fled to the north where Namibia um, borders with Angola. And in Angola, um, there were refugee camps with, with, with I dare say a number of, 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 of Namibians. And Angola was a communist country at the time. So the DDR flew in, East, Germ East Germany flew in and Cuba flew in. And, and Cuba, the Cubans um, saved the, the school children so that there is a huge um, Na Namibian diaspora in Cuba and the and east germany saved the the kindergarten age so 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 children who had not yet started school went to went to um went to east germany in in to this house where there were also a number of um swapo women who um who actually cared for these children. And the idea behind this was that they, they, um, they wanted, that East Germany wanted Namibia also to become a communist country. You know? So the support was taking the young, younger children to also um, uh, um, in, infuse this, this communist I ideology at an early age. But my focus here is also not only on the children, which I think um, is, is an important, important part of German history, but also looking at these women from Africa who were actually in the house working uh, from Namibia, working um, um, in the name of the SWAPO, um, which I haven't looked to, into further yet, but that is something that is on my long to-do list. Yeah? After the fall of the war, none of these groups um, had were integrated into the new German Republic. Yeah? Their contract workers um, got sent back but also the Namibian children who now had grown up, they were around 16, 17, 18 at that time, got sent back to Namibia, um, post-apartheid Namibia, as in the meantime, black Germans. You know? And um, yeah, there are also a lot of stories about this phase. And I think um, Stephanie Laya Okongo was mentioned in one talk, her mother also was um, her birth mother was also one of these um, one of these um, refugees who came to to East Germany at that time. So when Maya Yin, just to take it back to that point again, also talks about reunification and the fall of the war, and um, um, a lot of you know people celebrating in black and others uh, celebrating in white, or well, one third celebrating in white and two thirds celebrating in black. Also, I think these are stories that we have to take into consideration because when we think about the fall of the war, the the colonial continuity, especially in the faith of these children, is never mentioned. Yeah, because this has, this is a colonial continuity that even links colonialism to the fall of the wall. This is like one, um, one, one episode of, of, of erasing black bodies from Germany. This is what constantly happens. But let me go on. We heard a lot has been said during this conference rightfully about the, um, about the fate of the black post-war children um, here, just to, to, to mention the, um, the autobiography from Ika Hugen Marshall, who also was inspired by my Ayim, and also Marion's book. I think there is also the English title. Sorry, I couldn't find that cover in English, but the, the, the book has been translated. Um, Children of the Liberation, I think it is, um, by Marion Kraft, both Black German women of the early generation who have been born, born in Germany and also had close relationships 
to uh, each in their own right to Audrey Lord, uh, to Audrey Lord. And um, Marion Kraft has also published amazing works about her relationship to, um, to Audrey Lord. If you don't know that, then I think that you um, you definitely need to need to look into into that as well. After World War II, um, connected to this story also is the the, the forceful adoption of um, black children to the United States. Um, amazing stories that were shared with us here. Um, also, thank you all so much for that. But also thank you, Rose, I, I know you're listening. Um, I, I want to take the chance um, to not only thank you for this conference, but um, to also, I mean, I've known, we've known each other for 20 years. And back then I was at a point in my life where, um, a, a difficult place in my life, let me put it that way. And I, I really just want to thank you personally also for not giving up on me and um, actually inviting me, inviting me back to present my work. So thank you for that. The Weimar Republic, if we go further back, there is uh, are numerous figures which I could have picked here. Um, but one, I think that even that connects back to, um, to Fazi Ayanzen is Fatima Masakoi. That is um, Fazi Ayanzen's half sister. They have the same father, the consul of, uh, of Liberia in Hamburg, Momulu Masakoi. And he became um, consul in 1922. So we're in the midst of the Weimar Republic. And she joins him, uh, accompanies him to Hamburg. Um, actually, um, studies, studies medicine, I think it is, writes her biography. And, in the, and this biography looks at African-German relations, um, which I think are also um, a really important field in black studies in Germany that you, there's a, I would say Afro-German studies, but also African-German studies is for me a, 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 an additional field that we also need to, to, to look more into. She um, she writes also of me to, about meeting W. E. B. Du Bois, um, the the advocate. I, oh God, I don't even know what he wasn't. He was an activist, a journalist. He was a curator and an artist. He was actually my academic savior because finding W. E. B. Du Bois um, allowed me to write my dissertation about black knowledge production in Germany. So if you want to find out more about that, that's in my book, Afrokultur, where I look at the parallels between W.E.B. Du Bois, Audrey Lord, and my Ayim in a German context, which actually also is a theater piece, which I was allowed to put on stage in Brazil, here in the USA, and we're still waiting for the German premiere. No? So let me go on. Also mentioned in Farbe Ken, we know of the family Deek. This family is um, must be one of the oldest families that we know of, thanks to the work of um, Katarina Ugontoye and family member herself, Abina Adumako, who's here down at the bottom in the right. Um, as you know, um, Katarina Ogontoye was one of the publishers of Faber Bekenen. Ad Abina has her story in Faber Bekenen, as well as her, I think her aunts or great aunts, Erika and Doris Dieck are also in Faber Bekenen. And they, um, their story portrays all the, all the way back to the German empire. And I was here, I was interested in really the role of women during this time, because we've heard, we hear a lot about the um, I think it's the, it's the grandfather, Louis Brody, who was also an actor and very popular figure at that time. And um, he, um, he, he came from Cameroon and, and so to say starts that, st that family line, if you so will, that leads up to today, even um, to, I don't even know how to count generations, but there is also a younger generation with um, Abina's children or daughter, Antonia, who's um, doing amazing work as well. Mm -hmm. 
Millie, I had to mention Millie because this is really important project for me or has become an important project for me in the past two years. Millie, the painting that you see here right now, and I decided not to cover up anything, um, but um, I hope you don't feel offended, but please see this image as really an empowering image of a black woman. And I started searching for her after my film was published in 2018. This is the picture um, or the painting, Sleeping Millie, painted by Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, expressionist, German expressionist in 1911. And during my film, I was, um, we were um, recording in, in the Kunsthalle Bremen because uh, one of my protagonists had a film installation in an exhibition called The Blind Spot that was commenting on um, colonialism in, in Bremen, no? which is in North Germany, has a huge port. So they were looking at the, the colonial ties of the city. Um, and she had this, this, this film commentary in the museum. And so I go with her to the museum and we're recording, talking about this film, we'll, um, or before we actually start recording, we're walking through this exhibition, looking at the exhibition, and we both stop startled in front of this, this, this huge expressionist painting. Now, if you know expressionism, their, their paintings are like really, really, really huge. And um, it was, uh, we both, we were silenced just by the by the by the 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 strength. I don't know how to say wucht of this of this painting, you know. And um, um, all of a sudden, I don't know. I don't know what happened, but I had this urge to wake her up. I had the, I had this word urge. I was asking myself, is she even sleeping? You know, she might have her eyes closed, and if you if you zoom her in, you will see that her that she's not in a sleeping gesture because. I don't, well, I don't know, maybe some of you sleep and smile at the same time, but I would say that your, your face would be more relaxed if you're sleeping, you know? So she, um, she, she's become the story of my life because I've been searching for her ever since. And I'm, I've been knocking down doors and before 2020, which uh, I think um, Branwen put really, really nicely that, that before 2020 and after 2020 are two different political episodes. And before 2020, my film, I also situated before 2020, this was a, a phase of knocking down doors, of getting people to listen to our stories, of you know, getting them to, to, to rewrite the history of Millie. And at that time, nobody, it was just, oh, crazy Natasha again, knocking down doors, nobody wants to listen, edgy, okay. After 2020, I got invited back, <laughs> and I'm happy to say that I'm now um, doing an intervention in the, in the Kunsthalle Bremen, where this painting is, telling the story of who is Millie. I'm so happy to have found so many features of her life that I can put puzzle pieces together. I'm not, it's not a final result, but I think that it, in, for me, this project, um, which I actually called Who is Millie, it, 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 it is, um, it breaks the, tr the tr traditional narrative of black women in Germany. Um, and she, for me, is one of them. She is uh, so a real figure and not just a figure that is, was created in Ernst Ludwig Kirchner's imagination and mind. And this exhibition will be opening on, the, or the intervention will be opening on the 26th of April. So if anybody's in, in Germany at that time, um, Please go and see it and uh, pay pay tribute to Millie, who I think um, needs a huger, bigger space in history. And um, a week later, on the 6th of May, um, this is something that I also wanted to do when I was um, making my film, talking to these amazing artists in my film. I swore to myself, one day I'm going to do an, a curate an exhibition with all your artwork. And this day has now finally also come or is coming on the 6th of May. So keep that, that um, date in mind where I will be curating an exhibition titled I am Millie, showing the continuity of our stories and her stories as black women in the art context. I'm so happy to um, have um, had the, um, the possibility to 
to really invite alongside the, the amazing women in my film, amazing artists who, who are active in Germany. Um, so don't miss that. There will be a catalog also coming in the um, Orlando Falak, of course, because uh, although people ask me, I am still my home publisher is still Orlando. So last but not least for today, before I make a huge leap down memory lane and go right back to the, I don't know where I found the oldest woman, I would um, like to um, also quote Mary Church Terrell. Mary Church Terrell, so another US American, Black US American, African American, who was in Germany as early as 1904 at a women's conference in, uh, in Berlin, the International Women's Congress in 1904. She says, if anyone had had the courage to predict 50 years ago, that a woman with African blood in her vein would journey from the United States to Berlin, Germany to address an international Congress of women in the year 1904. He would have either been laughed to scorn or he would have been immediately confined in an asylum for the hopelessly insane. I was surprised, astonished. I don't know, I don't have a word for the feelings that I had when I first found this quote. And that that is dated 1904. This could be dated 2022, <laughs> I think. And uh, which actually leads me to the title of my, of my talk today, because we full circle back from the past to the present. We have, um, I think, as especially black women is doing this job. And I've also noticed that there are a lot of women and I'm so happy about that also present at this conference here. Um, where are the men? Let me just leave that as a question out there. A few of you I saw very respectfully, but um, the majority are women. And, the, and I think that this shows also the tradition and the context in which Father Buchanan actually um, was, was created was in a feminist context, yeah? And I think we cannot highlight that enough, yeah? Right down, and, and there were always con continuing transnational, if you want to use the, 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 the construction of national, I prefer actually diasporic context of, of women from the USA always constantly being in Germany and constantly bringing the message of intersectionality, yeah? Of race and gender, and also class being inseparable from each other, yeah? Which leads me to actually my title, as promised, to say that um, the past future is nothing that is over. It is something where we, I think, have not a contract to society as politicians will say, but we have a commitment to our community. We have a commitment to all of these women who came before us, who have paved the way for intersectional justice, which needs both race above all things and gender, yeah? Looking at the hypocrisy of wanting to erase race from the constitution right now. I hope that this talk has made it visible why it is so, 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 so important for us to tell our stories on the base of race as a social construction in intersection with gender as a social construction and class as a social construction. I want to bring it back to Emilia Roig's talk during this conference who couldn't have pinpointed that better, um, why it's so important that we have to learn to read race first before we delete or erase or replace it, or I don't even know, it's, it's not okay what's happening politically in Germany right now. I would like to add to finish up with that my book also focuses on many, many more women um, that include fictive figures from German literature from as early as the 15th century over um, enslaved women sold at the um, 
at the, at the enslavement market in Leipzig at the beginning of the 18th century, to women who were stolen in the early 19th century and given to presents to earls and lords, to numerous black women um, who have participated or for, were forced to participate in folk on the so-called human zoos, right up to the women of the 20th century, who I, uh, many of them who I've mentioned today, not to forget the amazing women doing the work today in the 21st century. So if I finally get to writing, I hope that my book will be published this time next year. And in that, with that said. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kelly, uh, for this wonderful, wonderful sort of uh, both broad in scope and deep um, historical um, um, uh, look that is also deeply political. Um, I appreciate that. Unfortunately, we have a panel uh, that is directly behind us, so we won't have time for questions. Um, but I just wanted to say again um, that for those who are participating in the audience, if you do have questions that um, we might take up at a later time, I would still appreciate you putting them either in the Q&A or in the chat. I've been really um, heartened to see the, the many responses um, uh, to this um, wonderful work. And I'm struck in particular by the way, Dr. Kelly, you've walked us through this process, which seems to me, you know, archival, right, a memory and this active reconstruction of such an important um, history. Um, and as well to think about the sort of technologies of capture, whether they're um, print, um, film, sound, music, radio, and uh, the sort of distinctions over time in terms of the periods, but also how these uh, modes of technological capture, capturing of that history interact with each other. So again, thank you, Dr. Kelly for a wonderful, wonderful talk and, and enriching and has given, given me, I know, a good deal to think about in terms of how I approach my own work as well. So thank you, um, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I didn't know that I was running over time. <laughs> oh no, it's a, I do not, I'm, I'm I, just realizing. We um, were all so enthralled. <laughs> I think I was just sort of like, this is really wonderful. And, and uh, what struck me about your talk really was how you walked us through your process of recovery. And so thinking about recovering of, of this really, these important histories, um, I think I was just really struck by that and the way that you sort of, um, both sort of untangle and also weave these threads together to give us a sense and a picture of continuity um, across um, time and space is just really um, incredibly important. Um, I think for a lot of us who are sort of wrestling with these different periods um, and sort of political modes and um, uh, modes of, you know, sort of navigating um, race, racism, structures um, as well. So I, 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 I think I'm, I'm going to speak for everyone when I say we really appreciate the richness of this talk. Thank you. <laughs> I know, I know I'm just, uh, but I, I, I think we, we are all just um, so appreciative of this work that you, that you continue to do. So thank you. Yeah, and thank you, and thank you. Um, yeah, this has been a great conference so far. Yes. I'm um, looking forward to the rest as in between all of the other things that I have to do, but um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> great. Thank you it so is what much. It is. Thank yeah, you. thank you. All right, thank you, everyone.